speaker. I invite the member for Fraser Nicola to lead the house in prayer or reflection. As we commence proceedings today in this assembly, we ask for divine guidance so that our words and deeds may bring to all the people of this great province hope, prosperity, and a vision for the future. May the deliberations in this chamber be characterized by temperance, understanding, and reason to the end that we may better serve those that have made the members of this house guardians of and trustees for all the citizens of British Columbia. Amen. Introductions by members. Members, before I invite members to make introductions, I would like to wish a very special happy birthday to someone who's working so hard to keep us safe and healthy day in and day out. I would like to wish a wonderful day to our dear friend, I'm going to name him today, Adrian Dix, Minister of Health. <laughs> Introduction by members, first one is Minister of Health. Oh, he's not there. 
<laughs> Member for Vancouver Hastings. Would the House join me in giving a warm welcome to the team for Mosaic today, including Olga Stahova, CEO, Sharon Butler, Director of Corporate Partnerships and Social Investment, Sherman Chan, Director of Family and Settlement Services, Michael Rodano, Director of Employment, Language and Social Enterprise, Sue Trevor, Director of Finance and Administration, and the Mosaic Board of Directors. Thanks for joining us today. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Statements by members. Leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is National Volunteer Week, and the theme is the value of one and the power of many. We know that there have been countless acts of kindness during the last year, but we also know that British Columbians are exceptional volunteers, not just during a pandemic, but all the time. As MLAs, each of us in this chamber could share many stories of amazing individuals and organizations that make a difference every day in our communities and our regions. And I want to share one of those stories today. It was started in 2017 by Valemount RCMP Sergeant Robert Dean as a way for new detachment members to get to know their community and to contribute in meaningful ways in the place they would call home. RCMP members would be joined by community volunteers and the Valemount Junior Canadian Rangers Patrol to buck and split wood at a variety of locations. Over the last four years, timber has been donated from a number of sources, including the Valemount Community Forest Company. The firewood is then loaded and delivered to seniors and others in the community that may need a little bit of extra support. And the generosity doesn't end there. Fuel, oil, and equipment are also donated by a variety of local businesses. Since 2017, more than 70 volunteers have completed over 600 volunteer hours. The volunteers have ranged in age from 8 to 80 years old, and an average of 12 households have been helped each year since the program began. I think this is exactly the kind of story that demonstrates the power of many. Today, during National Volunteer Week, it is the perfect time to honor and recognize this very special group of volunteers in my riding. Thank you for working together to improve the quality of life for everyone in Valemount. Member for Richmond, Queensborough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak about Rabbit River Farms. In Richmond, Queensborough, as you, turn off, uh, as you turn in off River Road and onto the farms, you'll likely be greeted by a very excited and friendly blue, Stephen Eastbrook's border collie, whose job it is to corral the hens who roam free outside the hatchery in a massive secure yard. Stephen is committed to the values of socially responsible, sustainable, and humane farming practices. The family farms produce certified organic, free-range, and free-run eggs. All their chicken flocks live in a cage-free environment and receive top quality feed, clean water, fresh air, and tender care. And I emphasize tender care. Stephen is a pioneer and leader in Canadian organic and cage-free egg production. In addition to being the pioneer in producing organic eggs, the first farm in Canada to do so, Rabbit River was the very first SPCA humane certified farm in Canada. And he was vital in having that certification instituted and recognized all across Canada. In recognition for his contribution to advancing sustainable agriculture and enabling easier access to new egg farming, families Rabbit River Farms received the BC Ethics in Action Award in 2001. Stephen was also crucial in authoring the original Canadian Certified Organic Egg Production Standards. He's committed, his, Rabbit Rivers and Stephen are committed to their livestock's health and well-being, uh, their family and employees' health and well-being, as well as the health of the community their customers, farming partners, and other stakeholders. They're a leader in environmental stewardship, in, in sustainable organic farming practices. The quality of uh, life for their livestock is of supreme importance to them. I, I myself have seen these happy and proud hens. Advancing humane farming practices for all types of livestock, this is the backbone of his business. Please join me in recognizing Stephen Easterbrook and Rabbit River Farms today. Thank you. Peace River North. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. History is not only about the past, it is ongoing and happening now. The Peace Crossing Historical Society in the District of Taylor aims to preserve and collect the history of the community and the surrounding area. The Peace Crossing Historical Society, Society is excited to be working with the District of Taylor Council and the surrounding historical groups to further the understanding and knowledge of the remarkable history of the area of Taylor. Peace Crossing has been collecting artifacts and stories in the Peace Region, working toward a museum in Taylor that will supplement the current assortment of history displays throughout our northern area. Many of these local precious artifacts are being stored in homes, garages and other museums. In 1972, the Taylor Museum was located on Peace Island Park uh, on the Peace River. The original museum in Taylor was first part of Camp Elkan on the Alaska Highway during the Second World War before becoming part of Central Elementary School in Fort St. John and then becoming the museum. I remember numerous times visiting the museum as a kid. Unfortunately, it did close a number of years ago and has yet to be replaced. Peace Crossing has also identified about 14 local veterans interred at the Taylor Cemetery with great thanks to Warren Moore's work. There are plans in place to have the cemetery graves marked on a public map noting these heroes. The Society's short-term goal is to seek the district's help with getting the Society's, first of all, fully functioning, while the long-term is looking at building and moving into a larger space. As any non-profit, they will be seeking grants for this work. Peace Crossing Historical Society looks forward to continuing to explore the vision of the museum in Taylor that highlights the community's long history. The huge collection is a valuable knowledge and archives that is currently housed by various people in Taylor, which really highlights the need for a permanent home. They also hope to be helping celebrate Taylor Elementary School's 100th anniversary this year. Societies such as the Peace Crossing Historical Society are priceless to our communities, and I applaud all of those who volunteer their time in preserving our history. Thank you. Member for Shuswap. Oh, sorry. Mr. on the list. Member for Vancouver Hastings. Mr. Speaker, today I rise virtually to acknowledge April 23rd as Mosaic Day. For 45 years, the Multilingual Orientation Service Association for Immigrant Communities, more commonly known as Mosaic, has enriched communities and furthered the success of newcomers in BC. As one of the country's largest settlement and employment services nonprofits, Mosaic's team of dedicated staff and volunteers serve roughly 35,000 people a year at 51 locations in Greater Vancouver, providing support and advocacy and services in 83 languages. Their mission is to create a sense of belonging for everyone, whether they are immigrants settling in Canada, refugees seeking asylum, or international students and migrant workers who are here temporarily. And while these numbers attest to the mission of Mosaic and the good work they're doing in community, what speaks loudest are often the smallest moments. Like when Sharvan, a newcomer from Iran, joined other seniors through Mosaic to knit warm clothing for people in need. Not only did she find a way to help others, but she was also able to bond with her granddaughter who wanted to learn how to knit. Or when Almira, a nurse from the Philippines, took a training at Mosaic to qualify for a position in a healthcare sector and got help to find a job. She now gives back to the community through her work with seniors and continues her education. Or when Ayan, a student from Somalia, found a community of other refugees, refugee youth through Mosaic. She is now working on a master's degree focusing on migration and diaspora studies and advocates for other refugees. These are, there are countless stories that I could share, but even these few moments show how Mosaic's positive impact has a ripple effect, changing lives, more lives in BC for the better. That's why I would like to invite all members to join me and everyone in British Columbia to recognize April 23rd as Mosaic Day and to celebrate Mosaic moments all around us. Thank you. Now member for shoe swap. Well, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. I rise in the house today to speak on an important community network in the shoe swap, Tsutsuea a women's entrepreneur network supported by Community Future, Shushwap, and funded through Western Diversifications Canada. This important project supports women-owned or women-led enterprises in the startup expansions or ongoing operational phases of business in the Shushwap. The name of the project, Tsutsuea, means butterfly in Shukwetmuk, 
and is symbolic of the butterfly effect. When one woman is empowered in a community, the effects can often be powerful and far-reaching. Tutsuea, led by project manager Carmen Massey, is guided by an advisory roundtable of experienced businesswomen from diverse backgrounds and is dedicated to ensuring equitable access to business training for women. Tutsuea works with the Shuquemek Communities, Shushwap Immigration Society, Canadian Mental Health, and other community groups to guide and support diverse women in the Shuswap. Through their entrepreneur and residence program, networking opportunities, workshops, courses, and marketing, Tutsuea has impacted hundreds of businesses and women in the Shuswap area. It is undeniable that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has been especially challenging for all, but women and their businesses have been particularly hard hit. However, throughout the pandemic, Tutsuea has continued to support women entrepreneurs, their programs, courses, and networks a truly remarkable and noteworthy endeavor. I'm incredibly proud to have uh, Tutsuea, Women's Entrepreneur Network, in my riding, and I'm very grateful for the work they continue to do. I urge all members of this house to think about the ways that you can support and empower female entrepreneurs in your communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Port Moody, Kukurtlam. Thank you. Uh, April is Autism Awareness Month. Actually, Mr. Speaker, this is Autism Acceptance Month because it's not enough to just be aware of autism. We all know that autistic individuals are an important part of our community. And I had the opportunity recently to meet with a constituent of mine uh, by the name of Margot Wask, who is a very talented autistic and non-binary artist and writer. They recently received a grant from the BC Art Arts Council Margot sells artistic creations such as enamel pins, face masks, and clothing on an Etsy page called Retrophiliac, and runs a Facebook group called Made by Autistics with over 3,200 members that supports autistic writers, crafters, musicians, and others that have something unique to share or sell. Margot's extensive artwork is bright and vivid and is something that they dream of one day showcasing in a live art exhibition. The pin that I'm wearing today is one of these creations, inspired by the neurodiversity symbol. Margot wants to move away from some of the puzzle piece logos and bluish designs that have been used to represent autism. Instead of a puzzle piece suggesting that something needs to be fixed or solved, this symbol is a bright and beautiful spectrum it looks more like a game board representing a journey. To find out more about Margot's unique journey and to learn more about their artwork and message, please visit navigatingjourney.com and I look forward to attending Margot's first art exhibition in the future. Thank you. I understand Minister of Health is online now, so I invite him to make that introduction he wanted to make earlier. Minister of Health. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I wanted to uh, wish a special uh, a happy belated birthday. The birthday was yesterday to Riley Duerson, who it's his 14th birthday. He's a regular viewer of our live stream and will be watching this uh, from home today. So I wanted to, he's also the co-host of a Vancouver co-op radio show called Neurodiversity Now and is a member of the Mayday Choir for Neurodiversity. So all of us who are, uh, he is watching today, please wish uh, uh, Riley and all of the people that he's involved with and involved in, uh, in uh, learning about uh, the legislature uh, a happy, happy belated birthday on April 19th. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On March 28th, I stood with leaders from BC's Asian community at the Stop Asian Hay rally in response to the horrifying shootings in Atlanta. Here in BC, anti-Asian hate crimes have risen by 350% in Burnaby and over 700% in Vancouver. 
Leaders from the community asked for the proclamation of Anti-Racism Education Day to prevent this from happening again. On April 6, Tuesday, I submitted the application to the proclamation's office and sent a letter to the Attorney General. Since I brought her from the Attorney General, I have started an online petition last Sunday, and in just over a week, over 6,000 people have signed in calling for this. My question is to the Premier on behalf of all the affected communities. Will the Premier proclaim May 29th as an annual anti-racism education day? Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question. I don't think there's anybody in this House who doesn't recognize and who isn't alarmed by the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes in our province, and not just in our province, across North America. This is a topic of discussion internationally. I think it's incumbent on all parties to work together to fight hate in our province, uh, all forms of hate, including anti-Asian racism. And I want to thank the member for her efforts to raise awareness around this important issue. In that spirit, I have uh, written back to the member to respond to her letter, to thank her for her work on this issue, and to share with her details about work that government is doing on a week of recognition around anti-discrimination. There are many initiatives that our government has put in place to fight racism. I'm happy to go into detail. But what my letter says to the member and what I'd encourage her to consider is that we work together on this week to fight hate, including anti-Asian racism, uh, because I think we're better together on this very important issue. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Member for Richmond North Centre on Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the mm -hmm. Minister's response and thank you for uh, suggesting that we should all work together. I have always been working together with this government from day one, and I wish this government can include me in a lot of consultation and idea sharing. I definitely would, uh, the whole BC Liberal Caucus would love to do that. But I haven't heard from the minister whether this government is going to proclaim May 29 as an annual anti-racism education day. Anti-Asian hate crime has risen by 350% in Burnaby and over 700% in Vancouver, as I stated in my earlier question. So next month is Asian Heritage Month. Sadly, rather than celebrating the contribution of Asian community in BC, we are forced to reflect on how discrimination exists in our society today. We need to do better. And it can start with action from this government today. The community who suggested the idea to me is now watching. And they are confident that the premier and the minister and this government are listening and are walking their talk. So my question once again to the premier, will the premier commit that this May 29 will be the first Anti-Asian Education Day. Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. If the member hasn't received my letter, uh, she will be receiving it imminently. And in the letter, uh, I thank the member for uh, bringing forward this request from the community for recognition on a particular day. Um, and I share with the member information about a planned week of recognition that government has in the works. Um, our work clearly overlaps. There's an opportunity for recognition uh, and for us to work together on this important issue of anti-Asian racism, as well as fighting other forms of hate in our province. And I look forward to working with the member on that. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. And part of that is around raising awareness. And part of that is around taking action, as the member says. And to that end, I'm very proud of our government's work through the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism, where she has delivered a Resilience BC framework that is already supporting uh, groups that are the target of hate. Uh, you know, I note that the w Richmond Women's Resource Centre, when they were the target of Zoom bomb uh, hate uh, directed at them, that it was the Resilience BC uh, spoke in Richmond that reached out to them to provide them with support. And so we need action, uh, we need awareness, and I'm happy to work with the member on ensuring that appropriate recognition 
uh, is made of anti-Asian racism and that we all fight it together. And I look forward to uh, working with her. Member for Kelowna West. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, I spoke with Christina Lamb, whose parent lives at Grace Seniors Home. I also have received many other letters from the, fa the families of the 70 vulnerable seniors living at Grace's Seniors Home near Chinatown at the risk of being evicted in the middle of the pandemic. We've learned BC Housing is funding the operator that is taking over this site, but will only guarantee their housing, quote, until appropriate options are identified, end quote. Families are saying that if they are forced to move out, it will be, quote, an earlier death sentence, end quote. Will the Premier today guarantee that all the occupants of Grace's Seniors Home be allowed to stay permanently? Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the important question. Uh, the federal government has a rapid response to homelessness initiative through which they directly fund nonprofit organizations to buy uh, spaces uh, where there are supposed to be spaces available uh, for people who are currently homeless uh, to move in uh, quickly. Uh, through that federal program, uh, the Grace Manor site was purchased by a nonprofit organization. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful that it was purchased uh, because it was at risk of being purchased not by a nonprofit organization, uh, but in fact by uh, uh, investors, speculators, or developers. So it's now in nonprofit hands. But the member raises an important issue. The building is, in fact, full of Chinese seniors, and they're very reliant on the immediate community as well as each other uh, for their health and well being. And we are seeing uh, a challenge around the conversion of, uh, in particular, uh, housing for Chinese seniors, uh, especially uh, older housing like this uh, in the Chinatown area in Vancouver. Um, I think we have a very elegant solution uh, coming. Uh, to provide support for those seniors and for their families who are clearly concerned, but also to recognize that the nonprofit who bought this space has a very significant number of urban Indigenous people who need to get off the street and get inside. So uh, I, I thank the member for the question. I assure him it is front of mind for me. It is a very significant concern for our government. And we are working with CMHC and the nonprofit who purchased the building to find a solution. And I think the member will be very pleased given the nature of his question. Member for Kelowna West on supplemental. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for that uh, response. And I like uh, the option or the elegant option you mentioned. But, you know, the families that are in there, Minister, disagree. Frankly, they have been rattled by the letter that they received from uh, Mr. Lee, who currently owns the building. And this was intended to be housing that fits a certain criteria by the city of Vancouver. The vast majority of the residents, their concern is they've been left in the dark about what's happening. And home workers are actually telling them that this is just a PR stunt by the government, so they should leave anyways. That's not what they want. These people are in culturally appropriate housing with the right care in Chinatown, and they're looking to stay where they're at. These evictions will destroy one-fifth of the culturally sensitive homes in the area. I have personally visited culturally sensitive homes like Grace and know how important and unique they are to the health and well-being of their seniors. So I would ask that the, uh, the Premier intervene and prevent these seniors uh, from losing access to their culturally sensitive uh, care. Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any uh, senior or family member of a Grace Manor senior uh, who is being advised to move um, should not take that advice. Um, we are working on a solution to this problem that will maintain uh, the social supports and the community supports for these seniors. Uh, we recognize the sensitivity and vulnerability of this group. Uh, I'm very grateful to the time that BC Housing has put in to work with CMHC and the nonprofit operator to find a solution uh, that will make everybody satisfied. Uh, and I think that we will have good news for the member. Uh, I advise him that this is not a PR stunt. Uh, this was a building that was for sale. Uh, could have easily been purchased. Uh, and in fact, there was a significant interest uh, in the building from the private sector to purchase it. And I also accept very much uh, that this was a very regrettable set of actions by the owner of the building, including advertising that he was looking for a warehouse to put these seniors into. Uh, and uh, I hope that was just 
a translation error because the original uh, ad was in uh, Chinese language. But I uh, am incredibly concerned about the actions of the owner of this building. Those seniors were not safe in their housing. It is now in nonprofit hands, and BC Housing is working on a solution to maintain those social connections that the member rightly recognizes are so important. And I look forward to having an update for them imminently. Thank you. Member for Saanich Northern Islands. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. When we hear about the Salish Sea, it's often in the context of the southern resident killer whale or the sockeye salmon. Both are iconic, both are endangered, and there is an overwhelming response in Saanich North and the islands when they're raised. Add the coastal Douglas fir to species that draw the attention of my constituents. A narrow strip of land circling the Salish Sea, including Greater Victoria and the Southern Gulf Islands, is known as the Coastal Douglas Fir Biogeoclimactic Zone. This zone is characterized by a unique geography, diversity of ecosystems that include unique wetlands, shorelines, and the Gary Oak Meadows. Over the last four years, my Islands Trust colleagues and I have heard from our constituents on the Southern Gulf Islands who want these sensitive ecosystems protected from clear cuts. Neither the Islands Trust nor the provincial government have the policy in place to stop clear cut logging from taking place in the area. It turns out the powers extended in lo the Local Government Act do not exist in the Islands Trust Act. My question, Mr. Speaker, is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Will the mi Minister amend the Islands Trust Act to allow local trust councils to implement and enforce bylaws to regulate tree cutting? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. It's an honour to rise in this House and receive my first question as the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And as those in this House know, I'm a passionate advocate for local governments, for families and for the environment. And I appreciate this question very much because I know how much the member cares about this issue too. Mr. Speaker, the former government did not do enough to prioritize environmental protection, nor was enough done to ensure that communities had say in how their forests were managed. And this government is focused on making different choices to make sure that forests and biodiversity are there for generations to come. So, Mr. Speaker, I did have the opportunity to recently meet with the Islands Trust. I commended them for the excellent work that they're doing and heard them listen to them to gain insight into their proposal. And we have committed to further discussion. So, Mr. Speaker, again, thank you to the member opposite for the question. Member for Saanich Northern Island on supplemental. Uh, thank you to the minister for the response. Clear-cut logging is having a dramatic effect on the landscape of the southern Gulf Islands. It's having a detrimental impact on the environment and Gulf Island neighbourhoods. Public information campaign is underway and Gulf Islanders have been demanding accountability from their elected officials, and they should. As the Coastal Douglas Fir Conservation Partnership website highlights, the CDF zone is, quote, home to the highest number of species and ecosystems at risk in BC, many of which are ranked globally as imperiled or critically imperiled, end quote. For more than a decade, the Conservation Partnership has included all levels of government, ENGOs, landowners, and industry, and yet the clear cuts continue unregulated. At the, local, at the Islands Trust Council meeting in September of 2020, a motion was passed by Council requesting the province give the Trust the power to create the tree cutting bylaws like a municipal government has. They've asked for these powers uh, through uh, their council table. So again, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Municipal Affairs, every day we delay is another day that these endangered ecosystems are at risk. Will the Minister commit today to urgently amend the Islands Trust Act uh, as per the request of the council? And when uh, can the council uh, see to have the power to create tree cutting bylaws? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And again, I know just how much coastal communities care deeply about forests, about waters, about wildlife, about biodiversity. And Mr. Speaker, as a former marine biologist myself and a member, a resident of a coastal community, I, I resonate and understand these concerns. So Mr. Speaker, again, I really appreciated sitting down and talking with representatives from the Islands Trust about this issue. Uh, the member opposite knows how much I care about this and, and I definitely invite him. My virtual office door is open and I'm happy to discuss this with him further. So Mr. Speaker, again, I, I'm committed to continuing to work with my colleagues. This government is listening to communities, understanding their concerns and we are here to work with them and I welcome the opportunity to discuss this further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Member for Vancouver, Langara. Mr. Speaker, the government has a responsibility to act to ensure that culturally sensitive care is maintained for the residents of the Grace Seniors Manor. Family member Tim Lam says, quote, all of this comes at a time of heightened anti-Asian racism targeting our elders. Not only do they face outward violence on the streets, they also face systemic violence from institutions that continually forget and devalue their needs, end quote. I've heard from one elderly couple together for 80 years who have been told they will have to be split up to qualify for long-term care. Will the Premier intervene and guarantee that these seniors will not be separated? Attorney General. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I hate to ruin a question period. I know how much work goes into preparing uh, these questions, and, and I don't pretend that this is a tri trivial issue. It's not. Um, but I can tell the member um, that telling elderly seniors uh, that they're at risk of being split up when I have explicitly said now twice that government, uh, I believe, uh, has a solution that we'll be presenting imminently that allows seniors to maintain their social, social connections both within the building and in the broader community is simply irresponsible. Now, um, I, I welcome uh, questions from the members on all matters related to housing, but I think that Grace Seniors have been through enough, and I'm very grateful to BC Housing, to CMHC, and to the nonprofit organization involved in working together to come up with a solution to support these seniors. This is not an outcome that anybody wanted, uh, that, uh, that seniors would be split up, and, uh, and I, I do understand the emotion around the issue and why it would be a serious issue of concern for the opposition. But I can assure the member, and I'll assure all the members that are going to ask questions after this, uh, if they continue on this theme, uh, it is front of mind, and we will address it. Member for Vancouver, Langara on supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. BC Housing failed to communicate with the residents here. There has been a total failure of communication. Residents in that senior's care home found out from the newspaper that they had to move. Advertising, looking for places to move the residents into the warehouses. This is the communication that was given to these residents. They're in their 80s and their 90s. The stress and the anxiety that this government has caused these residents is unforgivable. This government had the responsibility to ensure there was a proper, appropriate plan in place to ensure culturally sensitive care was maintained for these elderly residents. Let's hear from a family member again, quote, BC Housing appears more concerned with managing a PR crisis rather than finding an adequate solution for families, end quote. Families say they have virtually had no communication from BC Housing. Culturally sensitive care is very hard to come by. Two and three year wait lists to get culturally sensitive care. And there have been no guarantees it will remain under the Premier's plan for this housing. Will the Premier personally guarantee that these seniors will be allowed to permanently remain in their homes and keep their culturally sensitive care? Attorney General. Thank you, Honourable Chair. I mean, I don't want to let the facts get in the way of uh, a great question, uh, but, uh, but here we go. Uh, the, the statement about moving seniors into warehouses was made by the actual owner of the building. And we have, uh, 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 we, the federal government, has taken ownership away from that person, I think appropriately so. Uh, the member blames BC Housing for a lack of communication. This is a federal government program that purchased the building directly through a nonprofit organization. The member says that BC Housing is engaged in a PR campaign rather than taking actual action, despite the fact that now in three, and this is the fourth question in a row, I've been very clear that BC Housing has been taking action and we will be protecting those seniors. Those are the facts, Honourable Speaker. Member for Peace River North. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. The wages of all frontline workers in BC's community social services sector are funded directly by the province. But 17,000 workers continue to be discriminated against by this government for simply not belonging to a union. This is what Reach Child and Youth Development Society has to say, and I quote, 
Your work should determine your salary, not your union status. If you're going to do the same work, you should receive the same pay." End quote. Will the Premier stop this discrimination? Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Well, I would like to first of all thank the, the member for showing an interest in this sector. Uh, obviously, it's one that has been providing important services to British Columbians uh, throughout the province. And as the member knows well, it's a very diverse sector and there have been some historic issues that I'm proud to say our government has taken on head on. That includes issues around wages, recruitment and retention. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, the social service sector roundtable, which this government established is a very good venue for these discussions to be discussed and for us to find a resolution that the previous government ignored. Uh, so um, thanks for the question. Work is being done in this sector and uh, I think that all parties at the table are confident that it will be successful. Member for Peace River North on supplement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to say that uh, this minister isn't listening nor is he uh, working with this sector. The service agencies have had to file labour complaints. In the middle of a pandemic, the very people who are putting their health at risk are being discriminated against by this government. Community Support Care Society says, and I quote, for more than two years, we've been fighting for equality for all our community service workers who are delivering an essential service. It is time for the government to listen and act, end quote. So my question again to the Premier or the Minister, will they end the discrimination? Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Uh, thanks again to the member for his question. I uh, appreciate it. And I'd like to just reiterate the importance of looking for long-term solutions to the historic inequalities that have existed in the sector, in this very diverse sector. And I think it's very important that government takes this issue on seriously, as it has, and will continue to do. The table is uh, made up of members from the diverse sector that exists in this province and uh, issues are being discussed and res resolution is uh, forthcoming. We have, uh, we have a number of uh, ways of addressing this issue and the fact that we're together at the table dealing with them I think is a good sign. So I uh, appreciate the question. Member for Abbotsford South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On December 15th, 2017, we, the opposition, filed a Freedom of Information for a list of files. Finally, after over three years of delays, the government was ordered to produce the records. But in spite of that order, which was over two months ago, I might add, the records have still not been provided. The latest excuse is, quote, your request requires consultation, therefore, we are extending the legislated due date, end quote. To the Premier, who is it that's being consulted? Minister of Citizen Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, our government is working really hard to ensure that uh, our records are retained appropriately and that we're responding to all British Columbians and their requests in a timely manner. The volume of FOI requests has increased by more than 40% over the past two years. In fact, there has been a 250% increase from political parties alone, Honourable Speaker. Yeah. These requests have cost the BC taxpayers almost $43 million, and they take time. Broad sweeping requests like this for records that haven't historically existed for government, they didn't exist under the previous member's government, they didn't exist under our government. We have had to create computer programs to actually generate those requests. Members, programs. let's listen to the answer, please. Thank you, Thank Speaker. You. We have actually had to generate computer program or create 
computer programs to generate uh, those records. Uh, that takes time, Honourable Speaker, and that takes hard work from the public sector who is responsible for this. Uh, as the member uh, has indicated we have responded, and those records will be coming when they're ready. Member for Abbotsford Southern Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can understand why screenshots take so long to get, but this is a very familiar picture for the media, interest groups, and anyone trying to access information from this government. Endless and unexplained extensions, even for the most basic of requests, such as a screenshot. In this case, the request was over three years ago. The NDP was ordered to produce the records over two months ago, and yet we still have zip, not a single record, in spite of paying the $2,700 requested to the Premier or the Minister. Will they commit to actually meeting the current due date or will this government yet once again find a reason to delay? Minister of Citizens Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, and I want to let the member know that creating those programs to get those screenshots that didn't exist under their government, that don't exist under our government until now, until we've created these programs, that's 90 hours of work. Honourable Speaker, by our hard-working public servants. And the member talks about time, the time required. Under their government's watch, the response rate for FOI requests was 74% in 2015, 2016. Our government has a response rate of 86%, and that is despite the 250% increase. Our public servants are working hard Members. to fill these requests. Listen to the answer, please. Mr. Our Continue. government is working hard to fill those requests, Honourable Speaker. In fact, last year alone, we released 1.86 million pages of documents. We are being open, we are being transparent, and we will continue to be. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Member for Delta South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier's throne, Premier's throne speech did have one laugh line, but it's no joke to the people still sitting in the largest traffic bottleneck in British Columbia. The NDP said the George Massey replacement would continue to be a priority, which is just so disrespectful to the thousands of motorists, truckers, and transit using still stuck in traffic. If the Premier hadn't been playing political games, a replacement crossing would be opening next year. Instead, the Premier ignored all the work already done, the hours of public consultation, endless engineering studies, countless stakeholder meetings, and a mountain of paperwork, and we're still at zero. Will the Premier commit that actual funding for the Massey replacement will be in the budget? Minister of Transportation. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And it's... Um, it's interesting. I, I had uh, time to reflect upon uh, previous throne speeches after listening to a lot of disparaging content from the opposition. And the one that catches my attention is the throne speech that was delivered in June 22nd, 2017 by a, by a government desperate to cling on to power, about to test the confidence and fail uh, in the House. And that speech, that clone speech, I think it's better known as, said this, Recognizing concerns about the design, your government will listen and work collaboratively to move this project forward. Mr. Speaker, isn't it interesting that the opposition promised to try and cling to power that they'd go back to the drawing board? They promised that they would start to work with and not against local governments on this project. Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we have done. We have worked with the mayors in the region to align their regional transportation priorities with the province's regional transportation priorities, that work is complete. We have also satisfied another additional uh, condition for going forward, which is that um, we have worked on a different financing model. We utterly reject and continue to reject a toll-based regionally discriminatory tax that is applied to, to commuters each and every day just because they live south of the Fraser. 
and we rejected that private model that the previous government proposed. No tolls, Mr. Speaker. The third element that we need, the third element that we need is successful federal partnership. And I am pleased to say that our government has the highest level of engagement possible. I am working with the Minister of Infrastructure. The Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery is working with his counterparts. The Premier is engaged with the Prime Minister's office. This is a nationally significant trade corridor. It deserves investment from the federal government, just like bridges get in Ontario and Quebec. British Columbia deserves the same treatment, and that's what we're working toward. The chair will allow one more question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so to the 85,000 commuters a day that use the George Massey Tunnel, I think moving forward, we will take that answer as a no, we're not going to see anything in the budget about the George Massey Tunnel ever being replaced. The only work done on the tunnel has been the addition of some new lighting, Mr. Speaker, which makes it easier, I guess, for commuters, seniors and parents to see how long the traffic jams are when they're in the tunnel and observe the old grey cracked and decaying walls inside the tunnel. The Premier might say the Massey is a priority, but there's no mention of it, obviously, in the current budget coming up in a few hours, and there's still no decision on whether to go with the bridge or another concrete tube. So can the Premier confirm at least to me which option he's chosen for such a high-profile priority? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will say this to the member. I am proud to be part of a government with the most ambitious capital program in the country, and I think the member will be very pleased this afternoon that our government is building on the most ambitious capital plan in the country that existed before the pandemic to build back better after the pandemic. The member should know that corridor improvements are already uh, being contemplated and in the design phase and going to be underway uh, on Highway 99 so that the existing tunnel uh, flows better, that there is better traffic management there. And we are uh, determined to work with the federal government to make sure that this nationally significant trade corridor receives federal dollars. His government, Mr. Speaker, would have charged mums and dads every weekend who take their kids to the museum or go to a soccer tournament or heaven forbid, even go to work each and every day, thousands of dollars out of their pockets. We promoted affordability in every way as a government. We reject that approach. We have worked with the region to get a consensus on the best approach. We have a business case that we have shared with the federal government to support an investment decision. I'm proud of the work that we're doing and I'm proud of the uh, results that our government has made in investing in infrastructure and creating jobs in British Columbia. The balance caution period. Government House Leader. No, Madam Clerk. Orders of the day? No, <laughs> Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I call second reading Bill 3, Employment Standards Amendment Act. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I move that the Bill 3 be read a second time now. Mr. Speaker, Bill 3 amends the Employment Standard Act to provide up to three hours of paid leave per dose to employees in British Columbia who are receiving their COVID-19 vaccination. COVID-19 is an unprecedented public health emergency. Mr. Speaker, not only here in British Columbia, but across the world. An essential part of this province's immunization plan removes, is to remove barriers that prevent British Columbians from easily accessing the COVID-19 vaccine. With this leave, both full-time, part-time employees will be allowed up to three hours of paid leave per dose in order to be vaccinated against COVID-19. For example, if an employee needs to leave, need a leave uh, from work a half an hour early uh, to receive their first vaccination, they would be entitled to be paid leave for that half an hour. If for uh, a second vaccination, for example, the employee need to leave work in the middle of their shift, that would happen in different circumstances, different scenarios, Mr. Speaker. They would be entitled to be paid three hours and they will not be losing any pay or their job as a result of that. Mr. Speaker, removing barriers to employees 
easily accessing COVID-19 vaccine will help stop the spread of this virus, ensure safe workplaces for all, and support the economic recovery. While we hope that the vaccination clinics, their hours will provide enough option for employees to be vaccinated outside of their working hours, making sure that those employees who are unable to do so do not lose a pay uh, and, 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 and or their job is another way of removing barriers to the access. Mr. Speaker, there are many different scenarios. There can be many different scenarios. Many, you know, many places, the clinical hours, as I said before, are such that the people will be able to schedule their vaccination outside of their working hours. But there would be scenarios, different regions of the province, shift schedules are such, the clinical hours are such, or the location of those clinical, uh, clinics, Mr. Speaker, where workers may have to travel a distance, and they need this protection because workers are paycheck to paycheck. Many workers are paycheck to paycheck. They cannot afford to lose even this amount of pay in order to go get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, this leave will benefit to those in rural communities or those who must travel greater distances to get, a to, get to a vaccination clinic or where local clinic have limited hours. It will also help women, youth, minimum wage earners, and other active groups who are more likely to be in lower paid jobs that do not provide employer paid leave benefits. It would also assist indigenous women who we know have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Last spring, the government passed the Employment Standard Amendment Act No. 2, 2020, Bill 16, which introduced, introduced a job protected leave entitlement to employees impacted by COVID-19 including when they have been diagnosed with, with virus or in self-isolation or need to stay home to look after a child because of a school or daycare closure. More recently, April 1st, our regulatory changes were made that extended the unpaid job protected leave entitlement to include employees being vaccinated against COVID-19 or assisting a dependent family member to do the same. This regulatory change was brought in as an interim measure until ministry staff and I could consult on a proposal to introduce paid COVID-19 vaccination leave for, for legislation, by legislation. Bill 3 incorporated feedback we heard during these consultations with the business community, labor organizations, indigenous partners, and other stakeholders. Most employers understand the benefit of having workers vaccinated and the need to provide a safe workplace for both workers and their customers. In addition, Mr. Speaker, when their customers know that that particular business and their workers have the vaccination provided to them, they know that the businesses are winning their confidence to cater to those businesses, knowing that their health and safety is protected when they cater to those businesses, knowing that the workers are protected, knowing that the workplace is safe for them to do business with, and that is very, very beneficial to the businesses, and the businesses know that and acknowledge that. Now, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that many employers are also in a tough spot in, at this moment of the pandemic. The intent of this legislation is not to add burden to employers, but to promote the safety of employees, their employees, and all British Columbians by removing a barrier to their ability to receive COVID-19 vaccination. And to employers, I would like to thank you in advance for supporting your workers to get their vaccinations. Many employers, Mr. Speaker, are supporting their workers to go get vaccination because they know the benefits of having their workers vaccinated. And they know that this is the key for them to, for all of us to, to overcome the pandemic that we are facing right now. That's the best thing that could happen to all of us to stop this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, this is a one way, probably the best way is to have every British Columbians, especially the workers vaccinated at workplaces. And this bill will remove the barriers to vaccination for many of those workers, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the best thing for all of us, as I said, this is for us to, to stop this pandemic. 
Honorable Speaker, when we developed this legislation, we have been mindful of the requirement of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. We have done an assessment of this legislation as it relates to aligning with the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, introducing paid COVID-19 vaccination leave for employees in British Columbia covered by Employment Standard Act, as this bill proposes, does not uniquely affect indigenous rights described in the UN Declaration. We undertook consultation with employers and workers' representatives and other stakeholders, along with indigenous partners, to seek and consider their input and perspectives during the development of this bill. This included the indigenous leaders and other representatives on the BC COVID industry engagement table and representative from Minister's Advisory Council on Indigenous Women, the BC Association of Aboriginal, Aboriginal uh, Friendship Centers, and the First Nations Health Authority. I was advised that the paid vaccination leave will particularly assist indigenous women who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. I also heard that the paid leave could be a greater financial challenge for small businesses that do not currently provide paid vaccination leave, particularly those in rural areas and indigenous communities where travel may be required to access vaccinations. Honorable Speaker, our government appreciates this concern and it is one that the small business community has also raised with us more generally. Throughout this pandemic, we have been mindful of the need to support workers and businesses. That's why our government recently introduced another business support, the Circle Breaker Business Relief Grant. And, and as a way to support employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19, we are proposing the paid leave in this bill. Turning to the specifics of this bill, I will highlight some of the features of the proposed COVID-19 vaccination leave. The paid leave of up to three hours will be available to employees in British Columbia for each dose if they need to take time off work to receive their COVID-19 vaccine. If an employee needs more than three hours or time off to assist a dependent family member to receive their vaccination, the unpaid job protected leave introduced earlier this month will remain in place to support workers in this situation. The bill sets a formula for calculating the amount of pay for this leave, which is based on employees' average hourly wage for the previous 30-day period. This is similar to the formula already in place under the Employment Standard Act for calculating an average day's pay for the purpose of statutory holidays, and paid domestic or sexual violence leave. Honorable Speaker, the legislation will permit an employer to ask an employee a reasonable, sufficient proof that the employee is entitled to the leave. For example, a copy of the confirmation email detailing the date, time, and place of an employee's COVID-19 vaccination appointment. The bill specifically provides that the worker will not need a note from a doctor, nurse, or nurse practitioner to take this leave. If this bill is passed, the leave will be retroactive to the day it was introduced, yesterday, April 19th, to maximize the paid vaccination leave coverage for working age British Columbians. We're not alone in recognizing the need for this important support for employees. Saskatchewan recently passed a law granting one three-hour paid leave for employees to receive their COVID-19 vaccination. Bill 3 recognizes that the need for this leave is time-limited while COVID-19 remains a threat and it may be replaced or repealed, sorry, by regulation once the crisis has passed. Honorable Speaker, this bill not only supports employees but also helps ensure the safety of all British Columbians by helping to ensure that as many employees as possible are vaccinated, paid leave will play a vital role in the fight against the spread of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, British Columbians know that their government has their back throughout this crisis, and together we will get through this. 
Mr. Speaker, I look forward to debate on this bill. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Minister. Recognizing the member for Shushwap. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure. I'm very proud to rise in the House today on behalf of uh, the hardworking men and women of the Shrew Swap and in fulfilling my obligation, my duty as uh, the critic for Labour to respond to Bill 3 Employment Standards Amendment Act. And I think it's very important uh, that we put on the record that no worker should have to choose uh, between uh, a paycheck and getting vaccinated. Vaccinations are extremely important and I don't think anybody uh, would in any way uh, suggest otherwise. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, I think what's important to note is uh, the fact that as this bill is coming forward, we are now two months into the legislative session. Uh, the minister has characterized the fact that uh, government has the backs of employees and employers in the province. And yet, if we had a look, the pandemic has been upon us for over 13 months now. 13 months. We knew 13 months ago that there was going to be a need for vaccinations in this province. We certainly knew last fall, at the start of the fall legislative session, of the potential opportunity uh, for, for vaccinations. And yet, uh, this bill, which is a very simple bill, uh, it does not appear that it took a lot of drafting time to put together, uh, we did not see this previously. As well, when we had the December uh, sitting, there was ample opportunity in order to bring this legislation forward. And yet here we are, two months into the spring uh, legislative calendar, with this bill being tabled. Now, as the minister has uh, clearly indicated that uh, this bill, should it pass, will become in force and effect as of uh, yesterday, the day that it was actually tabled in this legislature. However, it's also my understanding over a million British Columbians have already been vaccinated. And so the timing of this bill and uh, when the minister uh, characterizes or tries to characterize that this government has the backs of employees, employers, that certainly was not the case when they called that unnecessary and risky snap election last fall. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, employers want to support their employees. There are ample opportunities, as the minister has indicated, uh, the opportunities for getting vaccinated uh, in many communities is seven days a week with extended hours of operation. And there's always the opportunity uh, for employees to schedule their vaccinations outside of their work schedule. And one of the pieces that uh, I'm hearing from business, uh, businesses, uh, Mr. Speaker, that are very concerning is the fact that this applies to even part-time employees. Now, there is not a definition of what a part-time employee is, but just for a moment, uh, let's just think about those struggling small businesses that are challenged right now, just keeping their doors open. They've had a significant amount of additional cost pressure, reduced revenue, business closures around the circuit breaker and otherwise, and yet now these businesses will be potentially saddled with additional costs. So for a part-time employee that may only be working 10 hours a week, uh, I fail to understand why it would be necessary for that worker to um, have the opportunity of paid leave when the large majority of their week would be open in order to schedule their vaccination at a time other than working hours. You know, we need to find balance. And that is the one challenge. What we have seen from uh, this current government is additional layering on of additional expenses and taxes on the backs of hardworking businesses at a time when businesses are struggling. There's no question that vaccinations are for the public good, for the greater public good. And most businesses would uh, amply uh, want to support their workers in becoming vaccinated. But I think we have to have a look at the manner in which this bill is being brought forward, specifically with the opportunity for uh, part-time employees to also have access uh, to this particular funding. So, Mr. Speaker, there's, there's many concerns that business organizations have. And uh, the other uh, area comes to uh, the proof, the ability of an employer to actually have confirmation that an employee has taken time off uh, for valid reasons and actually received the vaccine. Now, the minister has indicated that in order to request leave of an employer, uh, getting confirmation of actually your registered appointment, uh, whether that's either through a text or through an online email, that that would be sufficient evidence to provide your employer in order to 
gain access for the paid leave component. But what I didn't hear, uh, Mr. Speaker, what I did not hear from uh, the minister was how is the employer able to verify and ensure that the employee has actually been vaccinated? If the intention of this bill and this piece of legislation is truly to provide the paid leave to ensure that workers are not um, uh, losing any of their pay in order to become vaccinated, I think it's also to provide that balance, it is imperative that the employer has the ability to actually request confirmation uh, from the employee that they've actually become vaccinated. Now, uh, I'm certainly happy to uh, canvas some further questions through in committee stage, but I think that is going to be a very uh, important piece and that employers will want to know that if they are indeed paying their employees for time away to become vaccinated, that they have the ability of actually confirming that their employee has indeed actually obtained uh, that vaccination. So. Uh, again, I uh, just wanted to bring back the fact that uh, this particular piece of legislation is now two months into the legislative calendar. And as we know, over a million British Columbians have already received their vaccination shot. And so the, uh, the funding and the uh, opportunity for employees to take advantage of paid leave, uh, those million plus British Columbians will now lose out on that opportunity. And so, you know, as much as we know that uh, the vaccine uh, has been available and there's going to be the need and necessity for British Columbians to be vaccinated for well over a year now, it just seems a little bit uh, odd that this piece of legislation is coming in this late in the day. Uh, I was provided an opportunity to have a briefing uh, from senior staff in the minister's office yesterday. And uh, I asked specifically about the level of consultation that was undertaken and the timing of that consultation. And uh, as, although I had requested uh, more specific information about the consultation, the depth, the breadth, the number of organizations that were actually consulted, uh, I was denied that opportunity. And so I guess we have to take the minister at his word that the consultation has been very broad and include a large number of different business organizations. And then also, uh, Mr. Speaker, to think about the time. If we have known for over 13 months that there is going to be the need and necessity for British Columbians to become vaccinated, I would certainly be very interested to find out at what point in time uh, did government actually undertake that very important consultation. Now, Mr. Speaker, when we have a look at the supports that have been provided for businesses, and this is where it's important to have a look at the balance. We certainly want to support employees, but we also need to, and to be able to provide the necessary supports for the employers. And we know, uh, as I've, I've shared earlier, the significant litany of additional new taxes that have put additional cost burden on the backs of businesses. And the minister referenced uh, the restart program and uh, I'd just like to remind uh, listeners at home who may be watching today and may have interest in this particular topic, the fact that the $345 million COVID restart funding program, the botched $345 million program, was very late to come out of the gate. $5 billion in funding was provided uh, by all members of this legislature in unprecedented fashion last March. The $345 million COVID restart program was not announced until just days ahead of uh, the current premier dropping the writ and throwing us into an unnecessary and risky snap election. And as of last week, it's my understanding, only $120 million of the $345 million program has actually gone out the door. Well, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, the funding that was committed to and agreed by all members of this House last March was intended to be put in the hands and the pockets of struggling small businesses to help them meet their financial challenges. And yet what happened? The current government chose to put their political self-interest ahead of the health and well-being of businesses and employees and uh, individuals across this province. So I'm very concerned about the lack of balance. And when government does come forward with a program to help small businesses, it's delayed, there's significant challenges. And with respect uh, to the, uh, the current challenge with 
restaurateurs uh, that have been shut down from in-dining experiences. There's many businesses that are going to close over the next uh, coming months. And yet, the $50 million that was identified to help those specific businesses is not new money. They've simply reallocated funds out of the $345 million COVID restart program. That funding should have already been out the door. There's no benefit to British Columbians or the economy of this province until those funds leave government coffers and actually land in the hands of those struggling small businesses that are trying to meet payroll. So I'm very supportive of employees. I certainly uh, am very interested in hearing further commentary uh, through committee stage and to convince some, uh, canvas some further uh, very specific questions of the minister. But uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I really do uh, want to say that uh, I am very supportive, as are my colleagues, of supporting uh, vaccination programs in this program, province and providing uh, supports for employees. And, uh, and as I indicated at the outset of my comments today, is that uh, no worker uh, should have to choose between a paycheck and becoming vaccinated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the member for Saanich North and the Islands, third party house leader. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's my honor uh, to rise today to speak uh, to Bill 3. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister of Labour for bringing forward this bill and very much echo uh, the sentiments of my colleague uh, from Shushwa with respect to the fact that uh, we should not expect uh, workers in this province to have to make that difficult decision and uh, between uh, going to work and, and receiving a vaccination, just as we uh, want to see the support for British Columbians who are feeling ill, uh, to be able to make the decision uh, to be able to keep their job as well as keeping their uh, colleagues uh, in the workplace safe. Uh, we, we also want to be encouraging British Columbians to be getting a vaccination so that uh, those brighter days that this government continues uh, to talk about and that we can uh, perhaps see at the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, that, um, that indeed uh, through vaccination uh, we will be able to achieve that. Uh, and so this bill uh, does uh, provide the, uh, the, uh, the, provide the workers the, and, and the ability to be able to step away from their jobs, uh, to be able to go out and get that, that vaccination uh, without losing pay and without uh, perhaps uh, losing their job because of it. I do, uh, I think it's uh, perhaps uh, somewhat unfair to, to raise these within the context of this, uh, raise these issues within the context of this bill. However, I think it is important uh, to echo the, the, the comments that were raised uh, by the member of Shushwa uh, with respect to the delay in receiving this bill. Um, we were, and as well, uh, the, the online platform for British Columbians to sign up uh, for vaccinations. It is important uh, that British Columbians uh, know that uh, the members of the opposition parties are raising uh, these concerns uh, with government. When government has uh, said numerous times uh, that they were prepared and ready uh, for the vaccination program. Thinking back to this time uh, last year in, in 2020, uh, when uh, the governments uh, and our government was, uh, was talking about uh, how vaccinations could take 12 to 18 months, 24 months, uh, and that uh, really uh, the way that we were gonna get through this pandemic was uh, through uh, mass vaccination, it, it should be of no surprise. And I think that it is important uh, to note that um, that uh, the platforms that uh, that have been put in place, uh, the government took a long time to get there. Uh, we've uh, thankfully seen uh, the registration platform work uh, very well for the government. Um, and I think that it's important that uh, we and members of the opposition do apply that pressure to government to ensure uh, that, uh, that they are uh, um, putting in place the, the resources and the infrastructure to be able to support this mass vaccination. And this bill, I think, despite uh, what the member said earlier, uh, in, in the perhaps the delay and the, the number of weeks uh, ago that this could have been brought in, I'm very happy to see it here today. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm interested in the, the questions uh, around the consultation that will come, uh, I think, in, in the committee stage. And I uh, just want to uh, to reiterate uh, our support for uh, this initiative 
uh, to ensure that British Columbians don't have to make that choice uh, as it was framed earlier. So uh, thank the minister for bringing this forward and do encourage uh, the provincial government uh, with this vaccination program uh, to expend the resources to put in place the infrastructure to be able to support British Columbians uh, to get vaccinated uh, uh, as soon as possible. So uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak to Bill 3 and uh, look forward to supporting this bill through the process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member. Seeing no further speakers, I go to the Minister of Labour to close second reading debate. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and uh, I, I do appreciate the comments by the Member of the Opposition, Member from Shuswap, and the Member from Saanich uh, for their very valuable uh, input. Um, and I think uh, I understand uh, that uh, from their commentary that uh, uh, they do recognize the importance of having a very successful immuniz immunization program. The plan that the BC has put in place is one of the largest and one of the most complex plans that we have seen in the history of this province. Because, Mr. Speaker, all experts know that uh, having a successful immunization plan is the key to, uh, to coming out of this pandemic. And the businesses know, uh, and that's why they're supporting their workers already, many of them are, to encourage them to go and support them to go and get vaccinations. Workers know that uh, not only that it's their health, it's their fellow workers and the, the families that they go back to live with and their communities that they live in also is benefiting from the vaccination program. So overall, it is a win-win-win situation, Mr. Speaker, and we all understand the best thing that could ever happen to all of us, including businesses, especially businesses, Mr. Speaker, I will say, is to have this pandemic ended. And I think this is one way of doing it, removing barriers to vaccination. Many workers, I have said before, and it's been recognized that there are many of those who uh, for a variety of reasons, may not be able to schedule outside of their working hours. The member talked about part-time. I think the, at the end of the day, uh, it is a labor relation between employer and employee. If, if uh, uh, employee know that I have a number of days, I'm part-time worker for this particular operation, I have a number of days to, to go and get vaccinated and get my appointment during those off days, they will do that. But again, Part-time worker may be with this employer, but they may have another job somewhere else. So they may have to work with that employer as well. Overall, they may not have any time outside of their working hours to get vaccinated. So every situation will be different. But I do recognize and, and, and appreciate the comments and the concerns that are raised. Those issues were looked at. And I think a lot of thoughts went into it because we want to make sure that the employers aren't burdened over and over. With, with the cost implications of any policy the government bring in. We are very, very cognizant of that, 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 that situation. And uh, so again, uh, it is also recognized, and I appreciate the opposition, both parties recognize that we need to work together and, and to make the vaccination program successful. And that's the only way we are going to get out of this pandemic. So Mr. Speaker, I really do appreciate the comments and uh, uh, now, uh, I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I move second reading of the Bill 3. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Members, the question is second reading of Bill Number 3, the Employment Standards Amendment Act 2021. Those participating remotely, please prepare your voting cards. Those in favour, indicate aye. Aye. Those opposed, indicate nay. Motion is carried. Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill be committed to a committee of the whole House to be considered at the next sitting of the House after today. Members have heard the question. Those participating remotely, get those voting cards once more. Those in favour, please indicate aye. aye. Those opposed, indicate nay. Motion is carried. Member for Richmond South Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if you don't mind, I forgot to make this introduction earlier. I just want to wish. Member to... seeks leave to make Se an oh, introduction. Oh, leave, uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Member, please proceed. 
adopt. I'm still learning the protocols. I just want to take a moment to wish my nephew, Logan Robertson, a happy birthday. He's the first grandchild on both sides of the family and really love that little rascal. So I do want to thank, thank the house for giving me this opportunity and ask everybody to wish him a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, member. Acting government house leader. Uh, Minister of Labour, acting Speaker, government house leader. Speaker, we ask a five minute break, please. Oh, okay, a, re a request for a five minute recess has been, I will, I will approve that request. So we're on recess for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll re resume from our short recess uh, in just a moment to uh, make sure it's all together. All right, so we'd like to resume this session uh, and I'd uh, recognize the acting government house leader. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, Honorable Speaker, I call address and reply to the throne speech. Thank you, Minister. Uh, recognizing the Minister of Education. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, again, it is, uh, it's a pleasure to resume uh, the, my response to the, uh, to the throne speech. And I think when I left off yesterday, I was uh, singing the praises of my community of New Westminster uh, and some of the really important organizations and people uh, who work to make uh, that community such a, a thriving, resilient place. And I wanted to uh, also uh, mention uh, important organizations such as the Center for African Immigrants who have been the recipient of an important grant as part of the BC Multiculturalism Grants to work, uh, to, for work to tackle anti-black racism. And the center was formed in 2003 with the goal of supporting visible minorities with ethno-cultural barriers and assisting them in settlement, adjustment, adjustment and integration processes. And I, I, you know, I think the work that they do in our community is important and a real um, uh, example of the way in which uh, we are uh, increasingly valuing uh, diversity and, and inclusion. I wanted to also uh, uh, note that, uh, again, along the, the, the vein, too, of uh, the work that our government has committed to and that was outlined uh, in the throne speech around anti-racism, 
The Purpose Society, uh, also based in New Westminster, another very important part of the fabric of our community. And the Purpose Society provides social, uh, health, and education programs across the Lower Mainland. And they've received also a grant to further their community-based anti-racism work through the Resilience Anti-Racism Network. And this work is really, I think, foundational to the values that are expressed in the throne speech about how we build strong and resilient communities. Other organizations as well, like the Last Door Recovery Society and the Lookout Society, are providing very important supports to vulnerable people in our community, and they have been called on uh, to step up um, during this pandemic to uh, protect vulnerable people, and they have done so um, with compassion, with dedication, with commitment, uh, and we uh, all, I think, in our community owe them a debt of gratitude. So it, it really is uh, these uh, kinds of values uh, around putting people first, making strong investments in the supports and services that people need, recognizing and taking steps to support diversity, equity, inclusion, and reconciliation, ensuring that we are supporting people to live with dignity no matter what their circumstances, and in fact, working hard and fighting every day to change and improve those circumstances. Those are the key ingredients to building strong communities. That is how we nourish communities, and that is where community resilience comes from. These elements, investing in healthcare and education, childcare, skills training for workers to take up the jobs that will be created as we build a green economy. These are the values and actions that our government has committed to. And they're the values that uh, are reflected in, in the throne speech. And I think that, you know, in, in this time, we reflect on what is, the, what is the role of government coming out of and helping to, to navigate the, the scope of, uh, of, uh, of a global pandemic, an event that we had never anticipated uh, any of us would, would be living through. Uh, and the role in government, as we are finding, is, uh, is critically important in supporting communities, in nourishing communities, in ensuring that people have the, the, the services, the supports that they need. And uh, our government has been, uh, has been and will continue to be absolutely committed to ensuring that, uh, that British Columbians have the services and supports that they need. I want to take a, a moment now just to turn to specifically the, uh, the, the portfolio that I have as the role of um, Minister of Education. And I, I, I have to say, I mean, it, it, is, it is such an incredible privilege to serve in this, in this position and to be really an advocate for British Columbia kids and for the people who are working in our, in our education um, system. Uh, we have indeed uh, an excellent um, education system by many measures. Uh, but of course, we also have uh, some challenges that we need to, that we need to address. Um, and we have uh, laid out in our government program and through the values and principles we have articulated in the throne speech, a path uh, forward. Uh, I, I have to say that um, kids in particular, I think, have been doing um, a remarkable job during this pandemic. And I think that this generation of children uh, will, of course, be marked by their experience of the pandemic um, for a lifetime. They have had to pivot uh, suddenly to uh, online learning in some cases. Uh, they have uh, had, to, um, uh, had to change how they interact with their friends. And we have seen, you know, across uh, the education system, uh, incredible, incredible work as uh, done uh, in order to uh, to respond to this unprecedented um, uh, this unprecedented time. And I, you know, we've witnessed across so many parts of our society, and pr particularly in education, just remarkable feats of uh, compassion. And, uh, and, and, and resilience and, and as, as both uh, workers and families and, uh, and students have, have pivoted. You know, when we, uh, when we closed schools last um, spring as the, 
pandemic, uh, uh, at the start of the pandemic, we, we know that that had significant consequences in terms of uh, the challenges that it, um, that it posed for uh, both for students and, for, uh, and for, for everybody and for parents and for everybody across our education system. And in a report that was produced by the BCCDC in September examining this, this period, uh, they, they looked very closely at the, at the impact of this period on, on kids. And what they identified were uh, in, a, a, an increase in the sense of isolation, increase in mental health concerns, uh, uh, difficulties adapting to, uh, to online learning. Um, the fact that kids were missing their, their, their teachers and those social connections. And also the very real concern that this pandemic, as we know, has impacted uh, 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 people in, and communities in different ways. Um, there are uh, vulnerable communities, kids from, from living in vulnerable communities, uh, ha have been disproportionately imp impacted in negative ways by this pandemic. And that is why our government made, um, made it a really clear commitment following the advice of our provincial health officials that really keeping our schools open was critical. Not only to maintain the uh, connection to learning that is, going to, that is so important for, for children, but also to ensure that kids retained a connection to the mental health supports they have access to in schools. To the, uh, to the meal programs, to all of the other services that support a child as a whole individual. Because it's not as though kids are just only students when they show up on the door, at the door of the school and then they leave, their, they leave their, 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 the rest of their life behind them and they come in and they're just, just a student. They, they bring their whole lives with them. And some of those lives um, are challenging. And uh, school is a refuge and an important support, uh, source of, of supports. And we have prioritized maintaining uh, th those, criti those critical supports. And I'm a very, uh, I, I know that it has been, I know that it has been very, very hard. And there have been so many incredible acts of, uh, of support from you know, principals and teachers, ensuring that, uh, that, that, that kids who were not in school retained, uh, uh, had groceries. Um, ensuring that uh, that they that they're working to, working to maintain those connections, and it has um, it has been tremendously humbling to witness the, in, the 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 degree of compassion and commitment and effort that has gone into um, keeping schools going, and uh, we owe uh, a significant debt of gratitude to um, to all of those on the front lines in our education system for um, for making it work. Um, I, uh, I, I think that you know, we're, we're at a point, um, I know we're at a very challenging point in the pandemic right now, but we are of course starting to turn our thoughts to what, will, what do things look like in September as we build back? And uh, I think there's, uh, you know, we know we have a, a, a challenging few weeks, uh, several weeks to get through in, uh, at this point in the pandemic, but we know uh, that there's light on the horizon. And so when we are planning for September and we think about what is September going to look like, we certainly are hoping that that's going to look much more like a regular September for, um, for kids, in, uh, for kids in, uh, across, uh, across our schools. Um, and I, I, when I look at the way in which the values of our government are reflected in the mandate that has been set out for our education system, um, the values that are reflected in the throne speech. We, uh, we, are, we are working now on uh, developing an anti-racism strategy for, for education. We are working with uh, Indigenous rights holders on improving outcomes for Indigenous children. We are uh, increasing the presence and contributing to the and fostering the revitalization of indigenous languages, uh, which are critical parts of uh, our government's commitment to reconciliation. We are working on uh, developing uh, uh, on the ground in the school uh, integrated mental health teams to support uh, to support the mental health of, of children both and, and work and have a strategy, a uh, mental health in school strategy that is about um, supporting uh, students and also adults in our, school, in our school system. 
And of course, we, um, we uh, are uh, 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 going to bring our child care system into our, syst our education system and, and connect up those two very important um, elements of learning, early learning, early, early childhood learning with, um, with education. And build a uh, and 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 build the kind of childcare system in this province that we know um, British Columbians need, and that will be fundamental to to our recovery. We uh, are building uh, uh, on the um, the success of uh, the work that we did in the in the in the previous term of this government in which we um, hired 4,200 teachers, including 700 special education teachers, where we uh, in, in invested significant um, uh, uh, resources in uh, not only improving the staffing in our schools, but improving uh, the services in our schools. Uh, and I have to say that we also, um, I think this is one of the most significant um, elements of, of what we're doing is the investments in, um, in capital dollars and in, in, and in infrastructure. Infrastructure that is owned, built by and owned by British Columbians in which uh, to build a modern uh, education environment in which uh, kids can learn. And I've, I've you know, had a chance to tour the, uh, the, the new high school in my own community of New Westminster and I, I have to tell you it is um, it is such a remarkably different environment than the high school that I went to or that many of us would, uh, went to. Um, it is so open and light and, and designed around the principles of, um, of team learning. And uh, I, I think about the kinds of, um, the, the kinds of competency and skills uh, that kids are going to learn in those environments and how the kinds of contributions that they're going to make um, having gone through a, a modern education system, the kinds of the contributions that they'll make to um, to a uh, uh, to a mo uh, to, to to our to our society, and I have I it makes me feel very hopeful. I, I have to say, extremely hopeful. Um, the work that we are doing uh, on anti-racism in in the sector is critical. On reconciliation, all of those elements also are critical to building. Um, uh, to, to, to building uh, and imparting a sense of real empathy and compassion in, in kids. And I think that uh, one of the most exciting elements of the, of the, the work that we're doing around childcare is just is, is building all of those values and principles into early childhood learning right from the very beginning and then into, as kids go into, move into elementary school, and I, I, I think in, in, uh, in, in a, we are going to see such incredible fruits um, across society um, of those investments that we are making, both in uh, improving the operational side, uh, in the, the, the content and quality and empathy and compassion in our system, as well as uh, improving uh, um, the actual places that, that kids are learning in. So uh, I'm deeply privileged, uh, feel deeply privileged to be, uh, to be part of that work and uh, to have an opportunity to speak to and be part of uh, a government that is making such incredible, incredible contributions to the health and well-being of our society. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Recognizing the member for Saanich, as for Surrey Green Timbers. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is such an honour for me to speak uh, in, in the support of the throne speech. Uh, but before I start, I really would like to thank uh, my community of Surrey Green Timbers uh, for having the faith in me and getting me re-elected in the last election. I would also like to thank my campaign team, uh, especially my campaign manager, David Fleming, uh, Hassan Alam, uh, and Anmol Swatch for all the hard work that they put in in my election campaign, which was very, very different than the traditional campaigns that we are used to. Also, a big thank you to my constituency assistants, uh, Serena Garewal and Balkaran Singh uh, for all the hard work that they put in. Uh, in they, I always say about them that they are the ears, uh, my eyes and ears while I'm not there in the office and uh, uh, listening to the concerns of the community and uh, 
uh, doing uh, uh, providing advocacy. So thank you to all of them. Uh, um, we know, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the last year was really challenging uh, for all of us. We were not expecting like uh, last year when it first started, 2020, we had no uh, no idea how challenging it would be and how the communities have come together uh, and uh, face this challenge. And especially, uh, I would really like to thank the different community organizations and cities that have stepped up and helped the most vulnerable populations uh, in our communities. Uh, really want to thank our frontline workers, our healthcare workers who worked uh, who worked on the front lines and providing services uh, for for all of us that needed them, uh, and uh, at a lot of times putting themselves at risk. So my my hands go up uh, uh, for them. Uh, it is uh, really I don't even have enough words to say how thankful I am for all the work that they have put in. But we also know uh, with the challenges that came uh, last year and which we are still going through, uh, Mr. Speaker, that there were communities, there were cert certain sections of the communities that were disproportionately affected. Uh, we know that COVID does not do the discrimination. Uh, it affects all of us. But certain, uh, 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 certain populations, uh, certain communities, that are already marginalized, already oppressed. They felt the challenges. Uh, the challenges for them were, were much more grave uh, than that was felt by the majority. Uh, so um, I, uh, it was an honor for me, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, the Premier had this faith in me to appoint me as the first uh, parliamentary secretary for anti-racism initiatives. Uh, we know that uh, racism and discrimination has been pervasive in Canada, in, in British Columbia, but also uh, we need the commitment to tackle that, uh, to spell it that we have this kind of discrimination, we have uh, these issues uh, in our communities and how to tackle that. And that's why it was very, uh, I was so pleased and it was, uh, um, I felt so proud of our government that uh, uh, when when I see uh, in our throne speech that they have committed to the work that must be done to dismantle systemic discrimination, which is still a lived reality for so many in our province. I would really like to thank the work that has already been done and especially big thank you to my friend, my colleague from uh, uh, Minister of uh, Jobs and Economic Recovery, MLA from uh, Delta North, uh, the work that he has put in, uh, in creating the anti-BC, uh, anti-racism uh, network for BC, uh, which is known as the Resilience BC. Uh, and this year, um, we, uh, we recently uh, nearly tripled the funding for Resilience BC for all the work that they are doing. And this uh, funding lift, uh, Mr. Speaker, will support 36 organizations in 57 communities to to fight discrimination and hate with anti-racism initiatives throughout BC. Uh, this increase is part of the 2.9 million investment from BC's economic recovery plan, Stronger BC, to deliver anti-racism initiatives. And some examples, uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, that I would like to give uh, that how Resilience BC supports our communities, especially uh, the victims who are of the hate crimes. They are on the front line. The Resilience BC spokes. Uh, they are on the front lines, uh, con contacting, doing outreach and contacting those uh, uh, victims, uh, the people who are affected by this hate, and also creating a lot of educational uh, programs that will uh, bring more awareness about these issues. And I would really like to uh, name few uh, recipients of uh, which got this funding, um, uh, like Richmond Multicultural Community Services, uh, which will promote and further implement a community re response protocol, which outlines procedures to respond to racist incidents and to facilitate focus groups to understand how better to support victims of hate. Uh, Delta Assist Family and Community Services, uh, which will and they uh, will develop a social media training curriculum to help local social media spaces improve their capacity to respond to online racism and hate and to offer workshops uh, on active witnessing and bystanders interventions and refine community response to racism. 
Immigrant Multicultural Services Society of Prince George to create a manual for the public on the impacts of racism on health, especially in the context of COVID-19, and to raise awareness and lessen the numbers of racist incidents in the health sector. So these are just few of the examples of the organizations, uh, and uh, there are many of them, uh, Mr. Speaker, who are doing amazing work, and we want to enhance, uh, we want to empower them more, and that's why this funding, this increase in funding uh, will help support these organizations. Uh, also, uh, we have also committed uh, to introduce the race-based data collection to help identify gaps in services and, and how to address them. Uh, we know, Mr. Speaker, that systemic racism exists in policies and programs, and this has negative impact on people and communities. And we need better information to ensure that services are de delivered equitably. And race-based data collection is about identifying where gaps and barriers exist so we can provide better services for communities. And we are beginning to engage with Indigenous leaders and community groups to develop a clear framework that guides uh, that, that will guide what we are asking ind individuals to disclose and how to store the data, how it will be used, and with what goal uh, holding broader public consultations uh, this summer. This uh, data, uh, Mr. Speaker, is going to be so important to help us break down systemic barriers, but we don't want this data to be misused and misconstrued in a way that's harmful to communities of color perpetuating stereotypes and furthering racist sentiments and violence. And that's why we need to work with communities to ensure it is stored and used properly. And we are already doing some early work uh, on our end. And in the coming months, we will start engaging with community groups to develop a clear framework that guides what we are asking individuals. And also the government will continue working with the communities to develop BCs, first anti-racism law. The past 12 months, as I've already mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, have shown that we need to address uh, systemic discrimination and hatred in province. And we have seen a rise in anti-Asian and anti-Indigenous racism during COVID-19 and a worldwide focus on anti-Black racism through the marches for Black Lives Matter. This act is a recommendation from the Multicultural Advisory Committee the Multiculturalism Act has been in place for more than 25 years, and it's time for a transition to active anti-racism. And uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, this the introduction of BC's first anti-racism act will reinforce our goal to combat racism through BC and ensure that individuals are treated equally, regardless of their race or skin color. And we are hearing people that this needs to happen. And we are also hearing from them that it has to be done in the right way. And we are in the early stages of the work, uh, as I said, for the race-based data collection is likely to come sooner. And this one will uh, follow the uh, race-based uh, uh, anti-racism legislation will follow the race-based data legislation. And we have been gathering feedback from our Multicultural Advisory Council Resilience BC, uh, the first BC anti-racism network, and uh, and we are also trying to find out how we get together uh, with and how we uh, collect the information to get a, a legislation that is made in BC. And uh, we have also reached, as I mentioned, reached to our indigenous leaders to begin these discussions. Uh, I know I don't have much time, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to say that the work, uh, uh, I'm so proud of that, uh, uh, proud of our throne speech. And we want to continue the work that we started three years, uh, almost four years ago, of people, uh, putting people first, whether it was healthcare, providing the healthcare resources, building more hospital, uh, uh, providing more educational, uh, uh, putting more funding in our education educational sector, uh, uh, putting resources for the most vulnerable and the marginalized po uh, populations. And uh, always, whatever we are doing, we are putting people first. And that's what we will continue to do in the coming year. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I would like to um, uh, 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 adjourn. Uh, I, I would like to stop now and uh, I would like to uh, adjourn the debate. Members, you heard the motion. It's a motion to adjourn the debate. Those who are participating remotely have your voting cards ready. 
All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I move the House to now adjourn. Again, members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. This House stands adjourned until 1.30 this afternoon.